Hello. Alvin, this is the International Space Station Alpha. How do you hear us? Over? I read you loud and clear. This is a research vessel, Atlantis, and you are talking to Top Lab. And when you are ready, I will go ahead and, um, and send you down to the uh, submarine. We're ready here. We'd be happy to uh, be talking to the submarine. Over. Okay, uh, you can go ahead and start talking, and you'll be going directly to the submarine. Uh, be advised, you've got about a three and a half second delay, and so give us a little bit of time for the sound to get down there and back up. Understand that. Understand that. Greetings, Al Alvin. This is the International Space Station Alpha flying about 250 miles above the Earth's surface. How do you read us? Over. How do you read us? Over. <laughs> Hi, Sonny. Uh, greetings from Earth's deep inner space. This is uh, biologist Tim Shank of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and I'm currently sitting over uh, 2,500 meters or a mile and a half below the surface of the Pacific Ocean uh, inside the deep submergence vehicle Alvin. It's uh, great to hear you today. Uh, I'm joined by our pilot, uh, Alvin expedition leader Pat Hickey, who has had more dives in this submarine than, than anyone else. And uh, we're also joined by uh, Kate Buckman, a graduate student conducting her PhD research during our dive today. Over. Hey, Tim and the crew down there on Alvin. Uh, just to let you know, uh, there's uh, three of us up here. We're coming across the coast of Chile and Argentina in South America. I'm looking out the window at the ocean, uh, hoping you're having a good time out there, down there. Over. Down there. Over. Yes, we're having a uh, great time today. We're, we're diving on the East Pacific Rise, part of the world's largest volcanically active uh, mountain range. It's uh, 40,000 miles uh, long around the Earth's surface. So um, we're, uh, we're having a great time down here uh, looking at uh, deep sea hydrothermal vents or springs uh, coming out of the uh, sea floor. Over. Awesome, Tim. Hey, I'm looking at some questions here from kids around the world. One of them has to do with alien life forms. Um, we haven't seen anything up here, but I'm sure you've seen stuff that looks pretty weird down there. Over. Over. Yeah, absolutely, Sonny. It's some of the uh, life forms we see down here are um, rival those you might think of as being aliens. They, um, we've got 10 foot long tube worms down here <clears throat> that have no eyes, uh, no mouth, no gut, uh, but yet they thrive here uh, amongst chemicals coming out of the seafloor um, through heat generated uh, deep inside the earth. It's, a, it's a, as close as you can come to being in, a, in another world. Um, I'm sure likewise you're, um, you've got some fantastic observations that you're making, some experiments you're doing, and um, we'd sort of like to hear more about those things. Can you tell me where you are right now circling above uh, the Earth? Well, Tim, up, uh, up here we're doing a, a bunch of experiments. It seems a little bit probably more like normal life on a daily basis. Um, we get up in the morning uh, around 8 o'clock and uh, eat breakfast together. This is a, a long-duration mission for us, about six months up here, so it's a little bit more like daily life. And primarily our experiments are working on the human uh, body and how it's going to maintain life in space, in microgravity, so when we go to different places, back to the moon or to, to Mars, we'll be able to uh, know how to live uh, and how, how the body reacts and be able to be productive human beings. Over. Over. Yes, it seems like we're, we're both studying life in extreme environments, uh, different ends of the spectrum. Um, 
it's um, it, part of our mission here is um, work we're doing funded by the uh, Ridge 2000 program of the National Science Foundation and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And you know, our goal is is really trying to understand how life thrives thrives in these extreme seafloor environments. Our study site we've been working at down here for the past 15 years was recently overrun by a, a massive seafloor e eruption. Uh, 15 miles of lava have covered our experiments and our communities that we study here. And so we're, we're looking at how these, um, these animals come back and recolonize these areas. Um, we do this with only a, a month's worth of time. Uh, you know, in contrast to you with six months up there, we get about a month here and we actually have 22 Alvin dives during this expedition. And so we have to work 24 hours around the clock as fast as we can uh, to get as much data as we can before we're called back uh, into port. So there are some market differences in what we're doing, but there are also some really market similarities. Over. Jim, that sounds like a space shuttle mission because it's uh, about 10 to 12 days of nonstop action, um, particularly the one that I came up here with part of the crew that was uh, constructing and rewiring the space station. And it was uh, pretty much working all the time, trying to get some sleep in there uh, to make sure you can uh, think straight and do your work correctly. Um, one of the questions also talks about day and night and how, uh, how confusing that is. For us up here, we see you know 16 sunrises and sunsets in one one day. So it, get, it does get a little bit confusing, but we pretty much put ourselves on the schedule of Greenwich Mean Time, so we usually go to bed somewhere around 11 o'clock at night and get up at 6 at night. But for you, it sounds like your day is pretty busy uh, for the whole month that you're out to sea. Over. Over. Yes, a, a typical day for us starts around 6 o'clock in the morning when the, the pilots and some scientists uh, get the, uh, the Alvin ready for its dive. It takes a couple of hours. We load people into the submarine close to 8 o'clock in the morning, and then we seal the hatch with three people inside, and it's about an hour and a half journey to the bottom uh, here at a mile and a half down. We uh, have enough battery power to run around the seafloor and do our work for about five hours before we have to release some weights and then ascend to the sea surface to be recovered by the ship, which is usually around five o'clock in the afternoon. After that, we scramble to gra gather our samples together, uh, process animals, process other samples uh, through the wee hours of the night. As soon as the submarine's on deck, we have other operations we do we may tow a camera across the seafloor to look for other hydrothermal vent sites in other communities. We may put other things down that sample the water, the deep ocean water, a uh, mile down. And so it's around the clock action, uh, really nonstop. So it's a, it's a, it's a rare and, and, and a privilege uh, to be out here uh, with Alvin, uh, the workhorse of, of the deep sea, and um, we take advantage of uh, every minute of that. So. Over. Pretty, pretty incredible, Tim. Um, one other question here that I'm noticing is how we're even having a conversation. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Up here in space, we're in contact with Mission Control. You know, probably about 80% uh, of our time through satellites going down uh, to Houston, and then from there the conversation is distributed also to Huntsville and Moscow for our counterparts there. And so from uh, Houston, this conversation has been directed to uh, the ship Atlantis, and from Atlantis it goes down to you. How is that calm possible? Over. Over. Sonny, I'm going to turn you over to uh, our expedition leader, Pat Hickey, to answer that uh, that question. Just one moment. Uh, hello, Sonny. We transmit a sound carrier through the water and basically frequency modulate it. Uh, it's similar to a radio broadcast, except we're using sound through water instead of radio waves. Uh, once the voice uh, gets to the ship, 
the receiving underwater telephone converts it back into uh, the audio, audible communication that you hear right now. And then uh, we parallel that off of our receiving speaker in the underwater telephone into the uh, Iridium satellite telephone, which is then being beamed to you. Over. It's pretty amazing that we can even talk to each other. So this is this is really an, an honor and uh, pretty pretty great. Hey, what do you think about switching jobs? I'd love to uh, do your job and see what's uh, what's living on the ocean floor. How about uh, coming up here sometime? I think that's a wonderful idea. I would love to do that. There's no doubt that I, I love the work that I'm doing, and uh, and certainly. Uh, being on the seafloor is, is the pinnacle of, of doing this kind of research, <clears throat> but I would uh, welcome any opportunity to join you up in space uh, anytime, and I'll tell you, you're welcome in here anytime I can possibly have you in here, so that sounds great to me. Hey, hey we, we seem to have generated a lot of uh, questions from students uh, around the world. Hundreds and hundreds have actually poured in over the last couple of days, and so I'm wondering if you want to see if we can handle a couple of these. Um, I can uh, start off um, by uh, asking you if um, do, do you, um, there's a, Sharon R., a teacher at, at, at Bear Lake High School in Arcadia, Michigan, is asking us if we really lose sense of time and get disoriented um, in space and uh, out at sea like this. Uh, do you find that you have a hard time keeping track of the days up there, Sonny? And Tim, can you ask your, your the last part of you what you said your question one more time over? One more time over. Yes, we have a question that uh, do we have a sense of being disoriented in time? Are getting our time mixed up, given uh, given your travels in space. In other words, do you know what day of the of the week it is, or do you know what day of the month it is? Over. Yeah, that's a little bit hard. I think the daily on a daily basis we uh, we we've all know when we're tired and go to bed and, and shut the window so we can't see all the sun that we get the the number of times during the night. But the the day to day Saturday and when the, when the weekend comes up, that's a little bit difficult to uh, to actually put in perspective because you know you wake up, you don't have to worry about going to work. You're already here, so uh, you sort of feel like it's another work day. But we try to separate that just because we're here for a long duration and uh, you. Need Need to sort of get some rest and do your own private stuff rather than be immersed in work all the time. So we try to take advantage of the weekends and uh, do a, get get in touch with family and stuff. Over. Yeah.